Welcome to the History of Nerd United podcast. I'm your head nerd, Brendan. Thank you so much for being here. Today, author Larry Rocher and his book, Into the Amazon. It's the biography of a man named Candido Rondon. He's amazing. How amazing is he? Well, a lot of people, especially history nerds, have read The River of Doubt by Candace Millard. It was a huge book, great critical reception. It is something that I can recommend to absolutely anyone because it reads like a novel. It is a fantastic story about Teddy Roosevelt going into the Amazon, and one of the people that helped him was Rondon. Now, you can even tell in Millard's book that she wants to talk about him even more, but she's got to stick to the story. So luckily, Larry came along, wrote this biography, blew me away because he somehow took a man whose life is extremely complex, extremely long, with a lot of different paths that he goes down and makes it all make sense and makes it an easy read somehow. Into the Amazon is one of my favorite books, one of the best biographies I've read, so highly recommended, and I was so excited to talk to him. It's coming out in paperback as of the release of this episode, so please go out and get it. I'm going to shut up. Let's bring on Larry. And here we are with author Larry Roder. Into the Amazon, the life of, and listen, I'm going to mispronounce it, Candido Rondon, trailblazing explorer, scientist, statesman, and conservationist. Larry, how close was I? In the ballpark. <laughs> I'm just going to say Rondon the rest of the time. We're just not going to worry about That's it. That's fine. <laughs> well, listen, Larry, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. So I want to do a little background, Larry, real quick. Let me, let me jump right into it. Have you caused any international incidents while a journalist... Maybe that's too broad. Has the president of a country ever tried to kick you out? Uh, yeah, more than once in more than one country. But I guess you're referring to Brazil. In 2004, I wrote a story that the Brazilian government, especially the president at the time, uh, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva didn't like, and uh, he did try to expel me. The case ended up going to the Brazilian Supreme Court when somebody in Congress tried to block him, and the Supreme Court ruled that he couldn't do it, uh, and it's now a piece of case law in Brazil. He's back as president, of course, since January of this year, but uh, you know, I, I can go back and forth as I please. I don't think there's been any effort to get retaliation against me. It was, uh, you know, a, a storm while it lasted, and then it then it passed. Now, a lot of the articles I read on it were in Portuguese, so I had to kind of take what I could from there. But it sounds like your article might have suggested he was a bit of a drunk. And then what I found very interesting, what it seemed like his supporters didn't necessarily say that you were wrong. They said you didn't have enough sources proving that he was a drunk. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that I would say that he was a drunk. The story says that there were episodes in which he engaged in heavy drinking. There were all kinds of sources, um, many of whom didn't want to go on record for obvious reasons. But uh, one of the sources was his former running mate for president, his vice presidential running mate, who did go on the record because he was worried about the issue affecting uh, Lula's you know, efficiency in office. What the story did was kind of liberate Brazilian reporters to then write about the subject, too, because it was out there in the open. And there were other episodes uh, later on that the press dwelled on. I felt perfectly uh, comfortable with the story and the sourcing, and it led to some significant changes in attitude on the part of the press and the political class. Now, one more question on this, because, you know, first of all, uh, Lula, you could do a whole podcast on him. Sure. Seriously, listeners, just go to the Wikipedia and look him up. That's that's a long article, and Larry's not even in it. What I do find funny is, and I know journalists, you don't like becoming the story. You want the story to be the story. You um, don't want to yeah. be the story. But it does seem kind of funny because you were a bit of a folk hero for certain people, because especially if they were trying to poke him They'd say, but just remember what Larry wrote about you, or at least that's what I could see on Twitter now, X. Things are funny that way, because then when Bolsonaro, his exact ideological opposite, came to power in 2019, there were all kinds of people who thought, oh, yeah, he's going to jump on board with Bolsonaro. But that's not what happened. You know, I applied the same critical standard to Bolsonaro 
as I did to Lula. And some former fans became critics. But, you know, that you, you got to play it straight. You, you got to be consistent in your standards. And this is just a small part of your career with Brazil. It seems like Brazil's. Oh, yeah. It yeah. seems like it's some place that you really fell in love with because you've been a lot of places, almost thrown out of a lot of places, according to you. What brought you to Brazil? How do you look at the country? Because, I mean, this is your, at least your second book that really focuses on Brazil, right? Yeah, third. Yeah, actually, yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, I, I was in graduate school in the early 1970s with the intention of becoming an East Asian affairs scholar. I was studying Chinese and Chinese history, and that was the direction I was headed in. But my girlfriend at the time uh, was from Brazil, and eventually we married and we remain married. And um, she was working at a Brazilian television network. And I started to socialize with those folks through her. And then, you know, they said to me, well, why don't you come work for us? So I was working part time and I just really got fascinated by Brazil and Brazilians. And I went there for the first time, invited by the television network, the media conglomerate I was working for in actually, yeah, it was uh, 51 years ago this month. I just really got fascinated by the place. And the deeper I got in, the more fascinated I became. And the better my Portuguese got, the more was available to me in the way of literature and music and journalism. Uh, the whole culture opened up. So it wasn't just the politics. It was the country itself and the amazing culture it's created. And then traveling about, it's just a, a, an enormous country with a great deal of variety. So my attitude was, well, what's not to like? These guys are much warmer than the Chinese. Uh, I think I'm going to stick with this. Now, I remember the first time I actually saw Rondon's name. Uh, one of my favorite authors, Candace Millard, wrote River of Doubt, which we'll get into that, where why his name comes up and everything like that with, mm -hmm. with Teddy Roosevelt. But I remember seeing that, and it was funny, because even in that book, you can tell that Millard wants to write the biography of Rondon. Like, you can tell, like, she basically says it within the book, when did you first hear about him and what made you decide, I got to write a biography? First time I heard of him, I would say, was in the fall of 1978, the Northern Hemisphere fall, which is when I went to the Amazon for the first time. And the first place I went was to the territory of Rondonia, now a state. And it was tough. It was jungle, jungle, jungle. And it was hard to get around and there were insects and disease and it was just very challenging, very difficult. And, you know, I, I said to myself, goodness, here I am. It's 1978 and I'm having such difficulty, as is everyone else, and just getting things done. He was here 75 years ago. There was nothing here. And everything that's here now is based on his initial efforts. He must have been a really extraordinary, tough as nails individual. And I want to learn more about him. And so when I got back to Rio after that first trip, which was like a month, I started digging in. And the more I got into learning about him, it's just that his life is such a remarkable adventure that it seemed like natural to write a, a biography of him. It took forever for me to get to it because a project like this really requires, you got to be all in. You can, it's not the kind of thing you can do evenings and weekends. So uh, I had to wait until I was pretty much free of daily journalism to do it. Over the years, my wife's family would kind of nudge me saying, hey, when are you going to write that biography of Rondon you were talking about? And finally, one Christmas about, I think it was 2010, one of her cousins gave me Rondon's memoir. And I said, okay, I get the point. I'm going to do this. And so I started, as soon as I left the Times in 2015, I, I began work on it. I got a fellow at the New York Public Library, and that's when I took a deep dive into his life, his career, his beliefs, uh, his achievements. I, especially nowadays, there are things coming up where people are asking, like, who's allowed to do this and who's allowed to do that? Did you have any hesitation about writing biography about a Brazilian who is so important to the country and you're an American writing it? Was there any concern about that? Or was it like, I spend enough time here, people know I love this place, I can do it? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I had to be concerned because he is a national hero. 
he may be the only person that everybody on the political spectrum, right and left, idolizes. And there hadn't been really a modern biography of him written. They were all kind of hagiographies. And the last one, you know, had been written 25 years before. So naturally, I felt a little intimidated because after all, I am a foreigner, you know, and I, I was worried that people were going to say, well, who's this gringo coming in here to write about our national hero? But the truth of the matter is everywhere I went, I was received with open arms because the idea a foreigner is interested in this great national hero and not just any foreigner. It's this guy who's been around so long. We all know who he is. He speaks the language like a native, et cetera, et cetera. So those concerns on my end proved to be completely unfounded because everywhere I went, I was greeted with open arms, starting with the Brazilian military. I did research in their historical research division where all the records are kept. I, I, I started there. I worked at the military museum where there's another tranche of documents about him and where I discovered only after I got there, his diaries are kept. People couldn't have been nicer. It was, it was really, really delightful. And, you know, previous people who had kind of touched on the subject had said to me, Oh man, you know, I couldn't get this. I couldn't get that. This door was closed to me. That door was closed to me. None of that happened to me. So I was very grateful for that. And now when we're talking about Rondon and you're talking about very friendly people helping you out, I always go back to his own saying which you see basically throughout his life, which is die if necessary, but kill never. Right. Which, I mean, you think about this, he, he ended up being a two-star general, right? For, you know, he's out there, he's doing something at all times. He's working with indigenous people. Right. And that's his mantra that he sticks to. Where does that even come from? I mean, when you say going into the Amazon, not being able to move around, that's where he was born. That's where he grew up, right? Absolutely. It sounds like a contradiction, a pacifist general, but that's what he was. And that's what led Albert Einstein to nominate him for the Nobel Peace Prize in the mid 1920s, the first of three times that Rondon was nominated for that. And that came partially from his upbringing, but also from his exposure to uh, French philosophy when he was a cadet in the military academy in Rio as an adolescent, when he was like 17, 18, 19. He was exposed to the philosophy of Auguste Comte, the father of positivism. And that became his guiding light for the remainder of his life. He really bought into it. And even after a lot of his friends left it behind, he stuck with it. And positivism is kind of a religion of science and rationality. And of course, as a rational person, Rondon saw the futility of violence and believed that there was a better way to get things done. And that was true in relations between any peoples or nations, between Brazil and its neighbors. But he thought it was especially true of indigenous people, that they had been the victims of predatory relationships with the outside world, and that a friendly Pacific approach would yield much greater results. And he proved that that's true. But my question, too, is you, there's a lot of people who come from a certain place, they get trained, they go back to it, and they've forgotten everything they've learned, and they're vicious, and they're this and that. What made him so different? Right now, he came from these areas, right? He was partially right. indigenous himself. Right. But when he went back there, there is an amazing amount of restraint. I mean, when we talk about him, you talk about his building projects, the Telegraph is is the huge piece that he just opens up all these places. Yeah. With the cooperation of the tribes. For him, it very much didn't seem like it wasn't a political power play where he's like, I'll be able to get more done this way. It seemed to be ingrained in him. Is it simple enough to say that positivism just hit him hard enough that it stuck there? Or was he just different? Yeah, I, I think that's essentially it. And then when he got out in the field with superior officers who were also positivists, he saw them trying to apply this methodology and he saw that it, it, it yielded results. And once he got his first command, which happened when he was like 27, he just was all in and did everything he could to establish peaceful relationships with indigenous peoples in the areas where he was going to work. 
to the point that they often were willing to work on the project. And of course, they're outside a money economy, so he's not having to pay them. He, he's working with them as partners, and he's giving them food and when they wanted it, clothing. So it's the exact opposite of what we did in the United States with our telegraph lines going west across the Great Plains and the Rockies, and then the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, where the indigenous inhabitants of the area were seen as an impediment, a barrier, a problem. Rondon didn't work that way. He saw these tribal peoples as allies, friends, and co-workers. Now, it helped that he had been born into that world, that he was predominantly indigenous descent himself, that he spoke these languages or learned the languages when he didn't already speak them of the indigenous peoples in the areas where he was working. So um, he had both the mindset and the background to set this particular very unusual, uh, if not unique, course in establishing first contact with indigenous peoples. But it's also just an extremely treacherous way of doing things. And you really talk about this in the book, that basically he'd go somewhere, he'd set up camp and start getting on the right side of whoever he's with. Right. But as you mentioned earlier, it's the Amazon, yeah. right? Like you're with one indigenous group and you go one mile west. You're in a different indigenous group who found out that you were talking to the first one. Right. And now they want to kill you just by association. Yeah. So, I mean, this is... Every day, he's taking his life in his hands, right? Yeah, it, it's true. In one particular group, the Nambiquara, it took years and years of efforts on his part to establish a relationship with them. And he was shot by arrows. He got hit by arrows. His offers of friendship were rejected. Some of his men were killed. I mean, he could have been killed himself more than once, but he just persisted. And finally, they saw that he, he meant them no harm. And they invited him to one of their villages, and he acted respectfully, observed the ritual dances, and then joined in. He did all these things to show respect and a sense of fraternity in the French sense of the word, right? The French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Partly it's his personality, and partly it's just his system of beliefs and his behavior. And it's it's very funny thinking about it nowadays from that lens is he was basically a legend in his own time, like a rock star, because it was, oh, you're with Rondon? Okay, you guys can come in. Yeah. We're, we're not going to kill you because yeah. you're with our boy. Yeah. <laughs> but like everything will be cool, but don't do anything stupid. Yeah, you, you had all these predatory miners, rubber tappers cattle ranchers, timber operations, and they would just come in and they'd raise the forest and they killed anybody who got in his way. Not only did Rondon not do any of that, he took action in the so-called civilized world to blunt those efforts and fight them off. So he won the confidence of the tribal peoples and his adjutants, his staff, you know, had that kind of protection, too, because, yes, they were associated with the Pagmigera, the chief of chiefs, as Rondon was known. So it, it, it's his credibility, and it's also the fact that he blocked as much as possible, whenever possible, wherever possible, the efforts by regular coastal Brazilians to try and take over these these areas. And now let's talk about big event later in his life. He ends up having a bromance with a very, very famous American. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt shows up because that's what Teddy does. And Teddy decides, I want to see the Amazon and go a little crazy. How did Rondon get pulled into this? Was he happy about hanging with Teddy Roosevelt? How did that come to be? Yeah, it happened because Brazil's foreign minister at the time Roosevelt visited had been one of Rondon's best friends in the academy. His name is Lauro Muller. And so it was obvious to him that Rondon was the guy. And so when Roosevelt expressed a desire to do this, they called on Rondon. He was initially hesitant about it at first because he had read stories in the press, as everybody in the world had, about Roosevelt, the big game hunter on these safaris in Africa and going hunting in the Rockies and uh, you know, in the Dakotas, he didn't want a safari. He wanted a true scientific expedition 
And when Roosevelt said, yeah, I'm down with that, that opened the door. And in fact, the official name of their six-month effort, it's called the Roosevelt Rondon Scientific Expedition, and dozens of scientific papers came out of it afterwards. So when they met, there was this kind of mutual respect. Rondon knew that Roosevelt had been a leader of troops in combat in Cuba, and that Roosevelt's courtesy title was colonel. At the time, Rondon was himself a real colonel, and Roosevelt respected him for that. And right away, they kind of sized each other up as birds of a feather. Now, sometimes that leads to conflict, right? you got two alpha males trying to you know, be the man. But Roosevelt had the intelligence to realize, look, I'm a, I'm a first-time visitor here. I don't know this world. Rondon knows it back and forth. I'm going to defer to him as much as I possibly can. And he did. That's not to say there weren't moments of tension between the two of them. There were enormous moments of tension, as you would expect on an undertaking that was so dangerous, so hazardous, and involved so many people. But overall, that respect was sustained throughout. And afterwards, when Roosevelt looked back on it, he realized that Rondon and his staff had saved his life multiple times, that what they had done was an incredible feat, and that Rondon was an explorer of the first class, probably the greatest explorer ever of the tropics. And he tried to spread the gospel of Rondon when he returned to North America. And until he died, which wasn't that long after, because the trip had really worn him out, it was like five years later, he was always talking Rondon up, trying to get greater recognition for him. No, no, I didn't do this. It was re- It's really Rondon who deserves the credit, that sort of thing. And, you know, Rondon respected him because he didn't know what he was getting with Roosevelt. Is this going to be a guy who's imperious in his manner? But no, Roosevelt tried to be one of the guys. And he tried to pitch in. He tried to do the work that the others were doing. And Roosevelt respected that and above all respected Roosevelt's reverence of nature, wildlife and flora and fauna. Now, it seems if you put Rondon in the middle of the Amazon and he has to not sleep in his own bed, which I already have gone on record, he must have hated. (laughs) What I find very interesting and you can personally attest to. The Amazon is one thing, but Brazilian politics can be very, very different. Yeah. And it seems like when you look at the legacy and the legend of Rondon, you can see some cracks when it comes to dealing with the actual government of Brazil. Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, the time in which he was active was a very turbulent time in in Brazilian history. You know, he starts with an emperor in power. He's involved in the rebellion that overthrows the emperor and establishes a republic. He worked for the republic for 40 years. Then there's another coup and a dictator comes in and he had a very uneasy relationship with that dictator over the next 25 years. But the thing that's extraordinary, I think most extraordinary about Rondon is that he he didn't just have this outside game. He had an extraordinary inside game. He was as much at home out in the jungle, operating as a shaman almost, as he was in Rio de Janeiro, lobbying in Congress for the policies he wanted and the money he needed to get done what he wanted to do. He's an unusual figure because a lot of explorer types just don't do well in politics, and a lot of politicians would be completely lost in that world of the Amazon that was second nature to Rondon. He could just go back and forth with the greatest of ease, and I find that remarkable. What I find most remarkable is that there was a woman that would stay married to him through all of this. She must have seen him for like two whole freaking weeks. Yeah, it's really a remarkable relationship he had with his wife, Francisca, known as Eshika, her nickname. You know, he made a lot of sacrifices on the personal front in order to serve the Brazilian nation. She made as many, if not more. Rondon and and Chica had seven children. He was not present for the birth of any of them. She at times would go and live in the Amazon back at the base camp with the, these little kids, worried about them being exposed to malaria and you know all the other diseases that were then endemic in, in the Amazon. So she was a remarkably patient woman and also a woman of great intelligence. 
And, you know, my biggest regret in writing this book is that their correspondence, because they wrote each other so often, uh, even when he's out in the jungle, he's writing her daily, but their correspondence was lost during World War I. And the other remarkable thing that you can't document is he taught her Morse code so that when he was out doing his job building the telegraph line, at the end of the day, he would get on the telegraph with her and they'd talk back and forth. It's very romantic, but it's also almost unimaginable. Uh, and, and unfortunately, there's no written record of what those conversations were like. Now, one question I had for you, just a little bit of wishful thinking. If you could actually talk to any one person from his life that obviously you can't anymore, would she be your answer or would it be somebody else? Yeah, she would be definitely my answer because they did. I don't want to make it sound like they'd spent no time together. They did spend. I mean, they did have seven kids. It must have been at least a little bit of time. (laughs) Right. I mean, he'd be gone sometimes for two years at a time, but then he'd be back for a year. When he got malaria and was really sick, he was back for a year and a half. And of course, after he retired from the military at the age of 65, they spent a lot of time together. There's so much that she could have said you know, and told to enrich the story I was telling. And the truth is that some of the children and grandchildren did leave records that helped me. But yeah, she she is the the one that I would like to have been able to talk to. And then there's a second person who is his chief adjutant for a period of like 40 years that they were in the military together, a guy named Amilcar uh, Armando Botelho de Magalhães, also a positivist. And he was Rondon's biggest confidant. And the keeper of the records, and after Rondon left the military, uh, they were the closest of friends, lived near each other in the same section of Rio. And Botelho de Magalhães wrote three books about it, but there's so much more I would like to have asked him. But he died in the early 1960s. Now, we made him sound like a saint, right? Was he perfect? Did, did he have, you know, his problems just like anybody else? Oh, Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I, and I didn't want to, you know, ignore those. If you're if you're writing a honest, fair biography, you've got to have the high points and the low points. And I, I would say, I mean, he was tough on his the guys he commanded. He demanded as much of them as he demanded of himself. And as a young officer, he sometimes resorted to physical violence against men who were recalcitrant, who were disobedient. That was permitted under the rules in the Brazilian military at that time. You could order a guy to be whipped. You could order a guy tied to a tree and left out in the sun for a couple of days. And Rondon did that. Later, he came to see that it was counterproductive, and he abandoned that. Also, his attachment to positivism made it impossible for him to engage in politics to the extent that one would expect of a figure of his magnitude. And so he never became, he was offered governorships, cabinet posts. People urged him to run for president and he always said no. I think he could have done a lot more if he had been an active politician and gone that route. So, I mean, I think that's a mistake on his part. You know, another thing that troubled me was when he did Amazon border inspections in the late 1920s, he visited what was a prison camp and the conditions there were horrible. And he seems to have held his tongue and not denounced them. And, you know, I find that a flaw in his often sterling moral compass And, you know, to the point where one of his admirers, a French ambassador who also was a poet, you know, compared him to one of the apostles saying he's a modern day apostle. And in many ways he was. But, you know, he had these moments where he was definitely flawed, very, very human. I didn't want to leave those out of the story. You know, especially if you're an American listener or something like that, it might be hard to understand If you go up to any Brazilian and you say his name, is is he like Washington is to Americans in that you know the name, everyone knows who he is, they can give you at least a short biography of him? Is he that famous in Brazil? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's he's not the founding father of the country the way Washington is, but he's 
certainly as famous, well, as Teddy Roosevelt, let's say, even though he wasn't president. He's the only person in Brazil who has a state named after him, Rondonia. He's been on currencies. You know, he's been on a hundred Cruzeiro note. There are airports named for him. There are squares and plazas and schools named for him. He is a unifying factor among Brazilians of very different political persuasions. So yes, you know, kids are taught about him in school. I argue in my book, in the Brazilian version, that what they get in school is not a realistic retelling, that he's reduced to two dimensions. He's reduced to the dimension of the brave patriot who went out into the jungle and the guy who said, kill never, you know, die if you must. He was a much more complicated person than that. But yes, everybody knows that name. Larry, two more questions for you. Number one, there are these misguided people out here. They're out there and they're like, I don't read history. That was an annoying class I had to take in high school. I don't read it in my books anymore. All right. Now, you and I both know they're wrong. You know, they're wonderful people, but they're just wrong on this. If I sat one of those people in front of you and they said, why should I read Into the Amazon? What would you say? Well, this is a great adventure story. Some of the stuff that happened to him on his expeditions is as dramatic, if not more so, than what you see in fictional movies. I mean, you know, Indiana Jones has got nothing on Rondon. And, you know, Rondon did it over and over during 40 years. So it's a great swashbuckling adventure story. And it's a very human story because he came from nothing. He's born at the edge of the Amazon into poverty in a place where nobody knew how to read and nobody left there. And he worked his way up through the Brazilian uh, military hierarchy to become a, a marshal at the very end of his life. And he had this very rich intellectual life writing scientific papers. So it's very much a Brazilian kind of Horatio Alger story. I mean, how did this guy get from nothing to where he got? And it's just astonishing. He's an orphan. He's born with his father already dead. His mother dies when he's two. He's raised in this backwater. And yet somehow he makes it to the top without betrayals and by really adhering to a code of honor and chivalry that seems very old fashioned today, but won him great admirers back then. Now, Larry, generally speaking, that question I just asked you is the last one, but we have a more important one for you before we sign off. Okay. You are a new grandpa. How does it feel? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a life-changing experience. I mean, obviously, like any thinking person, I worry about the future, uh, not just short-term, but long-term. But when you have a grandchild, that becomes not an abstract thing, but very concrete. You know, what kind of world is she going to grow up in and what kind of world do I want her to experience as an adult? So it's a great joy, but also makes you reflect a lot. Did you already give her a copy of the book? Did you sign uh, it? Not yet. Not yet. I, I hope she'll I hope she'll read it when she's, uh, you know, an adult. Well, I bet she will. Larry, thank you so much for coming on. The book's amazing. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. And that's it for this episode. Larry, thank you so much. Into the Amazon, one of the best biographies I've ever read, people. And you know I read a lot of biographies. Hit us up Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Don't forget the YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. Until next time, nerds, stay cool. History Nerds United.